Let's look at this image for a while, and then we'll get back to our topic, which was looking at the different manifestations of a Baroque impulse in the works of, of Bormini in specific, and, and also Bernini and his contemporaries. The third great member of the Roman Baroque is Pietro da Cortona. And da Cortona simply means from Cortona, which is a, a town in Tuscany. And like so many of these Renaissance guys or Baroque guys, Pietro da Cortona is as comfortable doing painting as he is doing architecture. And this ceiling in the Barberini Palace is often considered to be the best thing ever when it comes to ceiling painting in the Baroque. And one thing that's so spectacular about it is just the very idea of how this thing engages the space below it. When we looked at the Sistine Chapel, or even when we looked at the Farnese ceiling by Anibale Caracci, which we looked at very briefly, just for me to say, not as good as I would like it to be, we noticed that there was this idea that a picture, a framed picture, was transported to the ceiling. So ontologically, and ontological means having to do with states of being, having to do with states of you know, what, what existence we're talking about. So if you look at a picture, you know that that thing is in a different state of being than you are. That's the thing on the wall. That's the image. And so Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel is very happy to keep that clear by framing pictures and having them be up on the ceiling. Pietro da Cortona does something quite different. Pietro da Cortona here is extending the space of the room illusionistically. Quite a theme, really. You know, you often get these paintings called things like the crucifixion, or the creation of Adam, or the separation of light and day. These are great biblical themes. The theme of Pietro da Cortona's painting is the triumph of the Barberini. The Barberini are his clients. That's kind of crazy, right? It would be like the triumph of Bill Gates going up in chariots into the sky, something like that. If you've got enough money, you can pay for that. I would definitely be commissioning that one if I were Bill Gates. But look what's going on. It's really quite amazing. It is as though the ceiling of the room has been blown away. There is an extension of the architectural features of the room into the painting, and then a dismantling of those features as this great sense of rising up happens. It's a trompe l'oeil perspective is being used, but it's a trompe l'oeil converging upward rather than converging forward. All of the techniques of the Baroque that we've admired in architecture are being trotted out here with great glory. And that is these complex compositional strategies of diagonal recession, of multiplicity versus unity, of loose handling of paint, strong plays of light and dark, and a moving of the pictorial image almost into the, the territory of theater. It becomes so dramatic and, and so active. Just wanted to show you that as a point of reference for where we've come since the days of Michelangelo, which were not really so very long ago. Just a little diagram from Christian Norberg Schultz, whom we mentioned before, talking about two basic diagrams for the Baroque church. One diagram is the longitudinal church that really becomes expansive around the dome, so much so that the domed part of the church becomes kind of like that great vault of heaven, that microcosm of the heavens that the centralized church tried to be. And the other diagram is the elongated central space where you give yourself an axis, but just barely. Or you, you have some kind of displacement of center along a line that begins to give you an ovalized space rather than a centralized space. Let's get back to the theme we were discussing last time, the confrontation between Bernini and Borromini, or at least a comparison between Bernini and Borromini. Borromini and Bernini were both together working on projects with Carlo Maderno. And when Maderno died, they more or less went their separate ways. And their separate ways were quite different. Bernini was very courtly. Bernini was very charming. Bernini was the favorite architect, not simply of the Pope, but, but also the king. Bernini went to France to do projects for Louis XIV, for example. Nobody was as charming as Bernini. And here you see a little handsome guy, Bernini, over here. Meanwhile, we have Borromini. And Borromini was very grumpy and very paranoid. Borromini eventually committed suicide by falling on his sword. And as he was dying, he was burning his drawings because he didn't want somebody else to get credit for designs that he did. Particularly, he didn't want Bernini to get credit for designs that he did. So he was in a difficult psychological state, let's say, whereas Bernini was, was very 
gracious. The implications of that, if you happen to be an architect, is you don't get so many clients if you're the grumpy, paranoid, schizophrenic guy. And you get lots of clients if you're the courtly guy that popes and kings like to spend time with. There are more differences between them. I would say one difference is that Borromini comes to architecture through architecture, through stone cutting, through masonry. When Borromini was a little boy, he actually cut stone on the Milan Cathedral. That was his first job. There are certain little winged angels that are signature Borromini elements, and you can find some of those in the Milan Cathedral. So he had this personal experience working on a Gothic site before he came, came to Rome. So the kinds of tasks that he would have the workers in the field do, he could explain to them. He knew exactly how everything got, got put up in the field. He knew it all. So he was really intellectual. He had in his own personal library over a thousand books. And in a day when books were precious, that is a huge library. Unlike, say, Michelangelo or Palladio, who had great patrons who brought them into this sophisticated way of, of thinking about the world, thinking about philosophy, Borromini is a kind of autodidact, which means he taught himself things by reading. He became familiar with theory. He tried to load on as many meanings as possible. Meanwhile, Bernini was a sculptor. He was really interested in these close observations of nature, very interested in the virtuosity of handling stone, but not really skillful in architectural questions. So let's look at a couple of projects that they did that are similar in terms of program. Or not similar in terms of program, but let's say similar in terms of ambition. The first one we're going to look at is the Scalareggia by Bernini at the Vatican. As an aside, aren't these men dressed nicely? These are the Swiss guards at the Vatican. And if you think they're dressed nicely, that's because Michelangelo designed their outfits. And they still wear these little darling outfits designed by Michelangelo. I think they look great. The task that Bernini has is to make an entrance to the Vatican Palace. The Vatican Palace is up on an upper level, and the desire is to make an entrance more or less through here, so a big stair that gets you to the upper level of the Vatican Palace from the courtyard in front of the Vatican. What he does is he designs this dramatic stair called the Scalareggia, which basically means the royal stair. And he designs it in a theatrical way. What would we expect from Borromini? We would only expect that he would design it in a theatrical way. So this is where you enter the system and you move up. And as you move up, you have these landings that are bathed in light from hidden light sources. You can see the rhythm of light coming into it from this drawing down below. There is a bridge where you have an opportunity either to move into the church or move into uh, some private quarters, and then you continue up. How's he designing this? You can look at the section, you can look at the plan, and you should immediately notice that he's taking ideas about perspective or ideas about trompe l'oeil and building them into the plan. The walls taper. And not only do the walls taper, but the relationship of floor to ceiling tapers. So it's a taller space here than here. He's building a fake perspective. He's building a trompe l'oeil that you walk through. And he's being very careful to manipulate not simply the shape of the space, but even the dimension of the columns and the intercolumniation between the columns and the amount of light that comes in. So you, you get this thoroughgoing uh, sense of, of being you know, carried away by the, the illusion of the space. And that this long march up to the top seems easy because it's so well orchestrated. Meanwhile, poor little Borromini, all grumpy. He has like three people who ever want to give him work. One guy is a cardinal called Virgilio Spada. And this is the Palazzo Spada, a mannerist building. Unfortunately, Spada already had a palace, but he got Borromini to do this little addition, the Galleria Spada. Here's a plan of it, and you see here where it's situated. This is a courtyard, this is the Galleria Spada, and this is the main courtyard of the palazzo. This is a funny shape also. It's a little tapering cone, similar to the tapering cone that we saw uh, being used by, by Bernini, but now at a much smaller scale. You see there's a little statue at the end of the line, and you have some sense, looking at this thing, of how big the statue will be. The statue is more or less half a column height, slightly less than half a column height. A person is slightly less than half a column height. So all of the visual cues of the receding lines, of the coffering, of the columns, make you think the little statue is going to be person height. But actually, ha, he tricked you. 
the little statue is like this big at the end of the line. And it is this, this trompe l'oeil. It's, I think, more effective than the Bernini trompe l'oeil. But the Bernini trompe l'oeil is really in prime real estate, which is to say the Vatican, and at a scale that's much, much greater. This is a little drawing showing you the details of how this illusion is created by stepping down the ceiling, by stepping up the floor, and by shrinking the scale of the columns, the intercolumniation, and the, the bays that introduce light into the system. Fabulous. So now I want to talk about this moment in Sixtus V's plan, the four fountains, the Quattro Fontane, because it's an interesting place where works by Borromini and Bernini come into direct confrontation with each other. Here we have the four fountains, right over here. One way that Domenico Fontana marked that special moment within the plan was to chamfer all the corners at 45 degrees and stick a fountain there, hence the four fountains. So we have this funny intersection. And at this juncture, we have a little church stuck in the corner by Borromini, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, and along this road, leading to the Quirinale Palace over here in Piazza del Quirinale, obelisk at the end, we have a Bernini church, San Andrea al Quirinale. So both of these architects have a challenge, and this is really one of the big challenges of the Baroque. Renaissance didn't care so much about it, but the Baroque does. And that is, how can you conserve the continuity of fabric and edge? How can you knit together the city and still identify monuments within the city? How can you make the monument stand out from the edge without rupturing the edge. And they both have different strategies for doing this. We'll look first at the Bernini. This is the long sleeve, it's called, of the, of the Quirinale Palace, just a thin little bar of program with gardens behind it. But still, it's the Pope's palace. So it has a certain hierarchical significance within the structure of the city. How will Mr. Bernini deal with that? And the answer is here. Mr. Bernini will deal with it by allowing the fake facade edge, the wall that defines the edge, to, to remain consistent, but to scoop a little concave circle out of it. It's kind of like what we saw Maderno doing at the Barberini Palace, where he sets his building back a little bit to create a forecourt, to, to carve out a space within the city that his building can become object-like in. But here there's a, a more complex game of interpenetration going on. He carves out a space, but no sooner does he carve out a space than he pulls out a facade, a temple facade, to occupy that space. And no sooner does the plane of the temple get established than he pulls out an eticule, this little round porch. There is a kind of interpenetration of concave and convex spaces that really animates the whole system. Here you can see the wall sliding behind the facade, the ovalized volume of the church pulling back here, and the little eticule popping forward. And maybe this is a better view of it. Here's a plan. And this is, this is uh, an example of how the Baroque architects are sly about centralized churches. You must not have a centralized church, Bernini. Oh, don't worry about me. It won't be centralized because it's an oval. And so an oval gives you a pretty good idea about the, the circle, but it's not a circle, it's longitudinal. So Bernini succeeds in not having a centralized church and is allowed to build this. It's even slyer than that, though, because you kind of want it to be centralized anyhow. So the long axis, strangely, is not the processional axis. So even though, it's, it's long, even though it has a long axis and isn't centralized, it's not like it's ideal for processions. There's an apse over here for the altar, and the length from the entry through the apse and the length from pier to pier on the long axis is the same. So he's kind of insinuated centrality within the ovalized space of the church. He is clever. But just look at the interplay between these different volumes. It's really, really powerful. You know, in Mannerist architecture, tensions are set into play, and they become irreconcilable. Like, ah, oh, how can you put these two things together? And all you feel is tension. And I think what's amazing about Baroque architecture, and maybe specifically Baroque architecture in the hands of somebody like Bernini, is how oppositions are set into play. Here's a plane. Here's a volume. Here's an edge of the city. Here's an object building. What are you going to do? No problem. I'll just synthesize. It'll be fine. I'll whip them up all together. So these things are reconciled in a way that seems harmonious, that seems to 
dissipate the idea of tension and give you something more like counterpoint than, than dissonance. This fabulousness of the stair pulling out, pushing you away as you're trying to move forward. And fabulousness of the edicule, this little volume pulling out and for a moment at least giving you an idea about the idealized centralized pavilion that is denied when you come onto the inside. On the inside, things are going on that we're familiar with because we looked at the Cornaro Chapel. So we're familiar with polychromy. We're familiar with all of the arts marshalling their forces together to create this really strong theatrical experience. So we have little angels crawling off the dome and crawling into the space of the church as though they have liberated themselves from heaven and they're coming down to meet you. And you can see them, you know, oh, I'm getting out of here, this is no good. Uh, happening up here and the colors are these rich marbles, these gold leaves, these saturated tones, quite different than the kinds of things we've seen before. So if we go down here to the corner of the Quattro Fontane, we find the solution put into play by uh, Borromini, where he's trying to do the same thing. How can I put a building in a dense urban fabric and simultaneously hold the edge and define the urban space of the city and still individuate the objectness and therefore mark the hierarchy of my building? He does it in this subtle and sly way. What's going on is this strange attitude about the facade. Here, by the way, is one of those fountains, one of those four fountains put at the intersection of the two Sistine roads. The facade seems to have a life of its own. The facade undulates. The facade wobbles away from the wall and disengages an autograph drawing. And by autograph, I mean it's Bernini's drawing, uh, Borromini's drawing. You can see in this drawing something funny happening, and that is the axis of the facade and the axis of the church are misaligned. What that means is that the, the facade is in fact peeling away slightly from the line of the street and inclining toward the line of this, this octagonal crossing that we have here. As though the facade wants to march away from street edge and occupy corner. And this autonomy of inside and outside is something that we already saw in the Jesu church by Vignola which more or less set the, the ground rules for subsequent Baroque churches. That is to say, the facade's doing one thing. The facade is a billboard. The facade is rhetorical, promoting messages of the church, and the body of the church can do quite different things. In Borromini, it becomes more animated, and the facade begins to take on the freedom to move anywhere it wants. This is an early expression of this theme that we'll see developed in subsequent Borromini works. This is the undulating facade, really exaggerated here in this drawing. And in its undulation, it begins to inflect toward the square of the four fountains so that it can begin to at least symbolically occupy the space of the four fountains as its piazza, even though it's on the flat edge of a street. And here's the fountain, the fountain embedded into the corner. This is what the plan looks like, and the plan is not ideal. The plan is dealing with all of these contingencies, and it's a tiny little site. Remember, Borromini is grumpy. Nobody's going to give him a good project. This is an, a project for an order of monks called Spanish Trinitarians. They dressed in outfits that were these kind of black, rough cloths. And Borromini liked the way they dressed so much that he dressed like that for the rest of his life. It was like, I don't know, somebody dressing like a 19th century gentleman. It was like 100 years out of style. But he thought this was correct. People were too pompous. People were too decorative. Let's, let's rein it in. So here again, we see an idea about, can I make it centralized? <laughs> I would like to make it centralized. And so it's an oval. And the oval takes the idea of center and stretches it and therefore meets, meets the brief. But it's not simply an oval. Borromini is always more complex and will never give you simply one reading when he can give you multiple readings. If you look at this plan, it's almost a superposition of multiple plan geometries. It's an oval or circle. We could say it's a version of a circle. It's an octagon. It's a cross. So there are three plan types superimposed. And if you think that the client is an order of Trinitarians, threeness is important to them. A very important art historian called Leo Steinberg wrote his dissertation on this church in like 1960 and goes through quite meticulously showing you that everything in the church can be read three ways. This notion of, of tripleness doesn't simply happen to the plan, but it happens at every point. So look here at the cloister. If we look at the cloister, we also see the idea of cross, 
We get cross by the columniation, pinching in here to give us the cross. We get octagon, and we have circles coming out from the side. You look at this plan, and if you're like everybody in the 18th century, you would say, oh my god, what is this guy up to? There was a famous 18th century critic called Milizia, and he talks about Borromini, and he says he's just indulging his whim. There's no logic to this. He's just making strangely shaped things because he can get away with it. He's talented, but he's completely undisciplined. He's the worst guy ever. People were really inclined to think that maybe this was the case. Maybe he, in fact, was completely undisciplined and making up shapes. Art historians didn't have access to his drawings really until after World War II. Very briefly, people saw drawings that Borromini did. They're held in a museum in Vienna called the Albertina. You get a bunch of Nazis in play, and nobody's looking at drawings in the Albertina. Instead, you're having wars. And so finally, after the war, people began to examine the drawings and, and saw that, in fact, there are these geometrical structures going on, that these things are tightly constructed. In fact, it was Leo Steinberg in his dissertation that began to say, you have this trinary expression of geometry, not one thing, but three things superimposed on each other the cross, the octagon, and the oval. And he even goes farther to explain why you need the cross, the octagon, and the oval. You need the cross because the Latin cross, the Greek cross, it represents the body of Christ, it represents the shape of a church, it's the symbol of Christianity. You need the oval because the oval is basically a stretched circle. And in that, it becomes a microcosmic reflection of divine order. And the octagon, at least according to Leo Steinberg, represents the piers that support the dome at St. Peter's. The octagonal crossing of St. Peter's is reprised here uh, in the church. This church is so little that if you read guidebooks, at least, let's say, old guidebooks, guidebooks that were written 50 years ago, it, it might say, San Carlo is so small you could fit the entire church in one pier of St. Peter's. That's a little topos that gets connected to the church. And I think a lot of that might have to do with the idea that there is this referencing of the, of the church in the geometry of the building. So it's tightly geometric. It's not willful. It's not whimsical. But it is densely loaded up with a symbolism. And this dense engagement with multiple readings, and not simply a singular reading, creates the complexity of the edge. You get all kinds of complex readings going on here. Like, you look at the wall. Ugh, that's such a bad plan. You look at the wall and you see a couple of things. Here's the octagon. And every time you have the octagon, you have a column there. And those are structural column capitals. So Borromini wants you to know that they're structural column capitals. So what does he do? He takes the volutes of these composite column capitals and, holds, and curls them upward as though they're supporting the roof. Over here, inside these little curved niches, <coughs> the columns are not structural. They're not holding up the dome. And Borromini marks them by curving the volumes downward, as if to say, no structure here. Pay no attention to the structure. So it's an amazing, amazing wall on the interior, not only because of its plasticity, but also because of the way it codes information about architecture. We looked at the plasticity of the surface on the exterior early on when we began our discussion of Baroque. And I just want to show you again how this facade operates, how it undulates and peels forward, as if to suggest that within this street edge, there is also object, also volume, pushing out and expressing itself. And here, where it hits the corner, it peels away and becomes just as thick as a column which suggests to you this migration of, of the facade toward a different condition. Look, look at the way the wall goes. It's kind of a running triumphal arch motif. It's constantly destabilizing itself. In one sense, it wants to organize itself around the arch and then the little, uh, the little trabeated piece on either side. And then in another sense, it wants to organize itself around the dome. So there's carving, there's pulling out, there's renegotiation for center. Fabulous. In fact, there's all kinds of meaning. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm a big fan of Borromini. If I had to say who the stars of this term are, I would say Michelangelo and Borromini right now are winning the race, in my mind. You could have other opinions. It's absolutely fair. You could like 
Bernini. That's okay. But Michelangelo and Borromini are the best. Because look at this. It's so loaded with meaning. Even looking back here, this is a tiny church. This church would fit in this room very nicely. It's so small. You get fake perspective. And so you get the sense that the thing is bigger than it is. Or look at the dome. This is incredibly complicated. No wonder the 18th century critics were screaming about it. But it's complicated in a really precise way. We know that the closer you are to Earth, the more contaminated the world is. It's full of decaying matter. Time happens. You can't have an ideal condition when you're trapped in Earth. So the building becomes incredibly complex when it touches the ground. But the higher up it gets, the more the building sorts out its geometry. So by the time we have the springing of the dome, all of this kind of craziness has contracted and resolved itself into an oval. By the time we come up to the lantern, this area with light coming into it, all that craziness has resolved itself into a circle with a triangle inside. The circle with the triangle inside is the symbol of the Trinity. Even look at the coffering. You gotta love the coffering. We've admired the coffering in things like the Pantheon because the coffering's great structurally and it marks out perspective in an interesting way. Here we not only have coffering giving us depth to the edge of the ceiling, but we also have that same set of symbols that we saw superimposed in the plan individuating themselves here. We have a circle, we have an octagon, and we have a cross. We have all of these elements knitted together in this amazing manipulation of field. Even if you look at the courtyard over here, you see some of the similar themes going on. We saw the undulation of the facade and thought, great. Look what happens in the courtyard. He uses a flipping of the balusters so that one has the fat part at the bottom, the other one has the fat part at the top, and the space in between becomes S-shaped. He's designing the interstitial space between the balusters to mimic the undulating form of the facade. Very clever. In his dissertation, Leo Steinberg also points out that if you were to take sections through the balusters and draw plans of them at different levels, at one level, you would have a circle, at another level, you would have a cross, and at another level, you would have an octagon. So thoroughgoing is this desire to make triple symbolism and to make form complex, not through willful random acts of compositional frenzy, but through layering on the symbolic value of each form. If you liked that church, stay tuned, because you're, you're really going to love this church. This is another little church by Borromini, a little bit later, 1642 begun, completed more or less in 1660. And this is St. Ivo a la Sapienza. La Sapienza is the university, the Catholic university. And this is a church for that university. It has a very specific program, a very specific site. And the specific site is here. The university buildings wrap it and form a courtyard. And when Borromini got the project, it had already been initiated. He was, he was given more or less a round foundation. He didn't have a lot of freedom in terms of whether he would ovalize the church, whether he would make it longitudinal. The foundation was there, and he was stuck with the idea of a centralized church. What did he do? And we already have an idea that if you're Borromini, you're going to be superimposing symbols together like crazy. Because why wouldn't you? You're Borromini. This church is the Sapienza. And Sapienza in, in Italian means wisdom. And somebody, at least in in Biblical lore who is considered to be incredibly wise is Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon. On one level, you have the Star of David, who is related to Solomon, becoming the plan of the building. Kind of clever. But not simply a Star of David representing wisdom, but the Star of David that gets manipulated with this interpenetration, concave, and convex spaces. That you come toward it, scoop of space, and no sooner does the scoop of space begin to create an area in which to act than the volumetrics begin to reveal themselves. These bulging lobes come out at you, and so forth. You come inside, some lobes are convex, some lobes are concave, and the, and the whole envelope of the building twists and turns. You could say that a diagram is kind of like this, your basic Star of David, that then becomes interpenetrated with circles. Another way to think about the plan, and Borromini would probably be thinking about it this way, is that he's trying to make a heraldic symbol that will flatter the Pope. And at the time that he 
initiates the commission, the pope is Urban, who is a Barberini. And the heraldic symbol of the Barberini is the bee. These are early drawings of the building. And right here, in the middle of the whole thing, there's a bee. And if you look at the bee, and you look at the plan of the church, it's almost as if the plan of the church becomes an architectural representation of the Barberini bee. Hilarious. Sadly, <laughs> there were like three popes that he had to go through before this thing got built. So he constantly keeps shifting the iconic program. Uh, the last pope that was here was Pamphili, and his heraldic sim symbol was the dove. But it's easy enough to get a dove in there, too. I could certainly draw that dove and persuade Mr. Pamphili, also known as Innocent, that that was all about him. However, look at the section. Even the section kind of looks like a beehive if he's, he's trying to flatter Mr. Barberini, Pope, Pope Urban. Beautiful church. Strange church. Strange church in every sense of the word. Just let's look at it from the outside for a moment. What does it even look like? You know, what's the facade? doesn't seem to have a facade, or it's playing this game where you negotiate between the condition of edge and the condition of object. So that edge of the university, wrap, 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 continuous, and then suddenly the dome appears. And unlike, say, the dome of St. Peter's, which is so far back that you basically have to be across the river in order to see it, this dome touches the edge of the building. You have immediate confrontation between the space of the dome and, this, and the edge. So they all constellate together, but they don't constellate together as a thing. It really becomes a kind of radical stacking. Here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a thing, here's a thing. And you might be inclined to say, what is he thinking about with all this stacking? In the collection of the thousand books that Borromini had, he had one book called Iconologia by Ripa, a Jesuit. And this book was a, a book of symbols. And so there are symbols that literally look like bits of this thing. Like this bottom part down here are a series of steps which represent in Ripa's Iconologia the steps of grammar, the seven steps of grammar. The little Dairy Queen element at the top of the building, swirly, 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 looks like the Tower of Babel. That this is the risk you run when you try to know too much. Uh, the biblical story tells you that way back, way back when, uh, everyone spoke the same language and people had the ambition to build a tower that would reach, reach to heaven. And they were building this thing and it was like Dairy Queen, it was swirly. And they, they had so much uh, pride in their own abilities to accomplish things that ultimately God smote them. They went crashing to the ground, the Tower of Babel fell, and languages became multiple instead of unified. So people couldn't communicate very well. This is a risk, the idea that if you become too prideful in your, in your knowledge of the world, you will have that fall. So it's surmounted, of course, by a cross. And I'm only giving you a few of the symbols. There are maybe about 40 different symbols from Ripa that can get mapped onto this thing. Look at the interior. This is another you know, game that Borromini is playing that we haven't seen played in a long time. And that is, he's manipulating the dome in a way that's really frenetic. We saw in uh, San Carlo le Quattro Fontane that the footprint of the building, depending on where you cut the section, changed from something quite complicated to something ovalized and something circular. But everything kind of resolved itself in San Carlo at the springing of the dome. Here, the springing of the dome directly reflects this weird little diagram of concave and convex incursions onto the geometry of the Star of David. That's where the dome springs. How do you resolve that? And luckily, Borromini was trained uh, on the job site of the Milan Cathedral, cutting stone with, with masons who were building a Gothic church. So he had the same ability to conceptualize complex curvature. And by complex curvature, I mean something curving in multiple directions. Hard enough to build a dome, but a dome is pretty rational. You have that same arc all the way through if you're making a nice Roman dome. But to make a dome where the curvature is changing constantly, that is rather complicated. But Borromini manages to negotiate this. Fabulous. These little mountains that you see over here that, that look like pediments, heraldic symbols of the second pope, the Kiji pope in the middle there, the stars that we see all over there here, heraldic symbols from the Pope. So he's really desperately trying to make popes like him. 
But he has a hard time with that because he is a grump and he has a bad temper and he's smug. So you guys, rein it in. But isn't this great? Look at that. Wow. You look at this thing from, the, from a distance and you get one sense of what it is. You look at it close up and you get quite a different set, sense of what it is. I want to show you another building by Borromini. Maybe not as spectacular as St. Ivo in San Carlo, but incredibly interesting and certainly a development of themes that we saw put into operation at San Carlo. And that theme is the, the wandering facade. This is the oratory of San Filippo Neri. And San Filippo Neri is one of those Baroque saints that was canonized uh, following the Council of Trent. San Filippo Neri had the idea of musical performance as something that was very central. And so the task that Borromini has here is not really to make a church, but to make an oratory for musical performance. So it's a, it's a funny project because here's the church, and the church is called Chiesa Nuova, New Church. And Borromini has to basically put a church right next to a church, which is, which is odd, right? How do you do that? And one answer is you begin to code it materially to look different. So the Chiesa Nuova is made of white travertine, and this is the stone of Rome. This is the stone of, of Roman antiquity, and this is the stone out of which most significant buildings in Rome are, are constructed. The oratory is in brick. Already there's a little gesture of decorum here saying, I am secondary, I'm using this, this lower material, you are primary, you have this fancy material. And there's also this idea of negotiating the urban fabric. We have this wrapper of urban edge that translates through the building and then you get a series of layers piled up on top of it. Big layers peeling away, peeling away. The facade, instead of becoming a thing on one surface, you really think it's several lamina of facade that are together. There's the five bay lamination, there's the three bay lamination, and then there's the one bay lamination, of course, out of which an edicule pops. And even the pediment that we have here, in a sense, registers the multiple origins from which it comes by having this kind of compromised or let's say conflicted geometry. But that's not the only way the facade wanders or, or behaves strangely. Here's Chiesa Nuova, fabulous. Here's the oratory, little. So already there's this kind of Baroque exaggeration of scale or, or rhetorical gesture to make things seem grander than they are. This little thing has a facade that's almost as big as the facade of this big thing. And how does he accomplish that? And the answer is, the facade in no way engages the volume of the church. It's just there. Or let's say, in some way it does. These are the limits of the facade, of, of the oratory by Borromini. And you come inside, and you enter a vestibule. So that's kind of clever. It's rhetorical. It's, it's act one of a drama of the senses, the rest of which will unfold in different ways once you've entered the building. At the same time, the local lie, not telling you the truth about the organization of the oratory, does tell you the truth about the organization of the monastic compound. So the facade centers on a series of courtyards, but slips away from the lineament of the oratory itself. Fabulousness. The language is crazy. I just think, not since Michelangelo have we seen someone so playful. Like, look at this portal. This is on the second story where you might come out and greet the people. What is going on here? You get this kind of wobbling as something seems to be transforming or transmogrifying before your very eyes. The columns slip up and begin to well out into this like ear-like lobe that suggests a column capital in the process of formation, but not succeeding in forming because things are translating to the vertical. Things are moving up with this holy fire. Crazy. And on the inside, we see more of this legacy of Gothic masonry that Borromini had up his sleeve, in that the entire vaulting of the oratory is ribbed. That's strange. We know Brunelleschi used rib vaulting, but Brunelleschi sort of used rib vaulting by default. He was trying to figure out how to put a dome up, and that was what was available. By now, Borromini is going back and pulling up something that had been discarded. And he's doing it to begin to get a continuity of reading between the pilasters that wrap the wall and the articulation of the ceiling. And he's also doing it to come up with a crafty corner solution, where instead of having one of those bad Brunelleschi corners, or let's say 
difficult to resolve corners, he simply puts one of these wrapping things uh, along the corner and pulls it up so that it becomes a kind of seamless transition of, of the continuity of the wrapper. Great. This technique of slippy slidey facade happens again and again in Borromini. This is a little church, not quite finished facade, but we can see his intention of the facade, Santa Maria delle Sette Dolori, St. Mary of the Seven Sorrows. This is a, a nunnery across the river in Trastevere. And here there's an idea about a facade, there's an idea about a center, but when you actually look at what's going on, here's the church. The facade has moved away to set up uh, the first event in a series of events that you will experience. And here's another building by Borromini called Propaganda Fide. And you might say, well, what does that mean? And it means propagate the faith. The word propaganda really comes from, from um, the Jesuits, this idea that you go forth and you proselytize. So this was the headquarters for the, for the Jesuits who were sending people all over the world to propagate the faith. Here, too, there is this kind of slippy, slidey facade. Here is the church, and here's the facade. He's just pushing it away and beginning to play different themes. And if you look at details of Propaganda Fide, you can see some of this crazy language that's going on with Borromini, where the piers seem to taper. They're really skinny down below. They get fatter, and then they get skinny again, like stretching, like gum. And they rotate out of the alignment here. And everything begins to crank as you read and register these pressures and these forces within the line of the building. And here, too, Borromini is playing around with these basket weaves, with this different idea about what it is to make a vault, and taking the pilasters that you have down below and wrapping them up. It's got a different idea about the corner here, and I think a better idea about the corner here. In <coughs> the oratory, there was a solid. There was a pilaster in the corner that peeled up. Here, there's a void in the corner. And so he never even has to solve the question of the corner. The corner is voided. The corner is, is not even there. It's just the space between the ribs. So clever. This is Piazza Navono, the greatest square in Rome. And this is one more point at which Borromini and Bernini are, are both operating in close adjacency. Bernini has the charge of making three fountains in this long space, and Borromini has the charge of completing this church. The church is Sant'Agnese. This also is a church that had been initiated by another architect, and Borromini is given the commission to complete it. The idea of Piazza Navona is kind of amazing. It's the sort of thing we've seen in city plans before. When we looked at Florence, we saw the <coughs> We saw the trace of an old arena in the city of Florence, and this was once a horse racing stadium. It was the Hippodrome of the Emperor Domitian. As in Florence, where the old Roman walls were encrusted with buildings, the same thing happened here too. The actual structure of the racing theater was reused to make all these building edges, but they kept the center void. Fabulous. Noli Map shows us it right over here. So what are these interventions? What is the strategy deployed by, by Bernini uh, to make his fountains? What is the strategy deployed by Borromini to make his church? The name of the church that Borromini is designing is San Agnese in Agone. The name does not refer to agony of her martyrdom, which must have been excruciating, but rather to the fact that in Greek, the kind of athletic competitions that were taking place in this stadium were called agone, or agonies, hence the name in Agone. Like so many of his projects, he was not able to conceptualize this from the ground up, but came into a project that was already under underway, initiated by very good architects, Girolamo and his son Carlo Reinaldi. Borromini came into it after the foundations were in, so the plan, for the most part, is not the work of Borromini. And the part that seems most characteristic of Borromini is the facade and the urban strategy, to wit, how do you put a building in a square as important as Piazza Navona and simultaneously maintain the coherence of the fabric edge and yet emphasize the mon monumentality of the church? And this was particularly important because the client was Pope Innocent, Pamphili, and the Pamphili Palace was directly adjacent to the church, and the church was to be the place for the tomb of Pope Innocent. It kind of reminds you of something we've seen before, for example, San Andrea al Quirinale, 
Not that you would want Borromini to hear you saying that. But what's happening is there's a little scoop. Edge, edge, edge. He's holding the edge of Piazza Navona. He's wrapping the edge of all the buildings, the domestic buildings, translating it through here, scooping out, and then popping forward with a temple front. So it's kind of consistent with the strategy we saw at the uh, San Andrea al Quirinale. And here, too, he's putting a dome. And the dome is right here, right at the foreground, so that there's no question about the fact that you read the dome as part of the church. So we get a kind of interpenetration of concavity and convexity configuring the church. It's also possible, and, and I would say probable, given the filial relationship between Borromini and Maderno, and given Borromini's strong Michelangelesque sensibility, that in building this church for the Pope, for Pope Innocent, albeit not at the Vatican, he took it as a private task to rebuild St. Peter's. St. Peter's that had been spoiled by the addition of the nave to Michelangelo's church and by the failure of Bernini to complete the towers. Here to the left we see St. Peter's, funny looking St. Peter's with its silly little dome, and here's a drawing of what St. Peter's would have looked like. So many of the strategies deployed here by Borromini seem to do a double task. On one hand, they hold back the pressure of the edge and permit the insertion of an object into the fabric, and at the same time make visible the immediate proximity of the drum and the dome on the temple-fronted portico, bracketed by towers. Dreams for St. Peter's that were never realized. So now we have towers, and that works really well. And the towers also work really well, almost like bookends, stopping the march of edge that we have coming in along the edge of Piazza Navona, bracketing it away, and allowing the object of this church to be instituted here. This church was done for the Pamphili family when Pope Innocent was reigning, and that was really lucky, because one of the craftsmen that was working on the church was sloppy. And so Borromini killed him. Well, wouldn't you? Craft, come on, think about it. <laughs> People look really shocked. The guy had bad craft, so Borromini killed him. But, luck but luck luckily, he like beat him with a hammer. It wasn't like he took a gun out or anything. It, the hammer was right there. Craft is really important. If you have any trouble with craft in studio, I want you to get better fast. This could still happen. Pope Innocent got him out of trouble, and so he was, con he was able to continue practicing. But that was considered to be a black mark on his record, and just one of the indications that he's a little bit out of control. Right in front of the Church of Sant'Agnese, we have a Bernini fountain of the Four Rivers. And this is kind of a great thing. This is one of those obelisks that gets placed hither and yon in the, city of Bar in the Baroque city of Rome. And we know from our discussion of the obelisk at St. Peter's that obelisks are heavy. This is a small obelisk compared to that one. But still, look how Bernini situates it. The theme of the fountain is the four rivers. And so you have river gods of Asia, Europe, America, and Africa lounging about, and this kind of frothy whipping up of waves all around them, and then real water down below. And what Bernini actually does is he has a void underneath this heavy obelisk so that it's a miracle enough that these obelisks can, can be moved, but if you situate one in this kind of precarious place, kind of fab. These are some of the different river gods down here. And you might, you might notice that on the church, there's sort of a statue of the Virgin. And guidebooks will tell you that this character, river god who's going like this, is afraid that the, the Bormini church will fall down. This is a little joke being made by Ber Bernini because he's full of life. And up here you have the Virgin blessing him and saying, don't worry, Borromini built this church. It'll be fine. Towers won't be falling here. We're going to continue next time talking a little bit more about Pietro da Cortona and also urban space uh, and the deliberate design of urban space in, in Baroque Rome is the longitudinal church that really becomes expansive around the dome. So much so that the domed part of the church becomes kind of like that great vault of heaven, that microcosm of the heavens that the centralized church tried to be. And the other diagram is the elongated central space, where you give yourself an axis, but just barely. Or you, you have some kind of displacement of center along a line that begins to give you an ovalized space rather than a centralized space. Let's get back to the theme we were discussing last time, the 
confrontation between Bernini and Borromini, or at least a comparison between Bernini and Borromini. Borromini and Bernini were both together working on projects with Carlo Maderno. And when Maderno died, they more or less went their separate ways. And their separate ways were quite different. Bernini was very courtly. Bernini was very charming. Bernini was the favorite architect, not simply of the Pope, but, but also the king. Bernini went to France to do projects for Louis XIV, for example. Nobody was as charming as Bernini. And here you see a little handsome guy, Bernini, over here. Meanwhile, we have Borromini. And Borromini was very grumpy and very paranoid. Borromini eventually committed suicide by falling on his sword. And as he was dying, he was burning his drawings because he didn't want somebody else to get credit for designs that he did particularly didn't want Bernini to get credit for designs that he did. So he was in a difficult psychological state, let's say, whereas Bernini was, was very gracious. The implications of that, if you happen to be an art, aren't these men dressed nicely? These are the Swiss guards at the Vatican. And if you think they're dressed nicely, that's because Michelangelo designed their outfits. And they still wear these little darling outfits designed by Michelangelo. I think they look great. The task that Bernini has is to make an entrance to the Vatican Palace. The Vatican Palace is up on an upper level, and the desire is to make an entrance more or less through here, so a big stair that gets you to the upper level of the Vatican Palace from the courtyard in front of the Vatican. But what he does is he designs this dramatic stair called the Scalareggia, which basically means the royal stair. And he designs it in a theatrical way. What would we expect from Borromini? We would only expect that he would design it in a theatrical way. So this is where you enter the system, and you move up. And as you move up, you have these landings that are bathed in light from hidden light sources. You can see the rhythm of light coming into it from this drawing down below. There is a bridge where you have an opportunity either to move into the church or move into uh, some private quarters, and then you continue up. How's he designing this? You can look at the section, you can look at the plan, and you should immediately notice that he's taking ideas about perspective or ideas about trompe l'oeil and building them into the plan. The walls taper. And not only do the walls taper, but the relationship of floor to ceiling tapers. So it's a taller space here than here. He's building a fake perspective. He's building a trompe l'oeil that you walk through. And he's being very careful to manipulate not simply the shape of the space, but even the dimension of the columns and the intercolumniation between architect is you don't get so many clients if you're the grumpy, paranoid, schizophrenic guy. And you get lots of clients if you're the courtly guy that popes and kings like to spend time with. There are more differences between them. I would say one difference is that Borromini comes to architecture through architecture, through stone cutting, through masonry. When Borromini was a little boy, he actually cut stone on the Milan Cathedral. That was his first job. There are certain little winged angels that are signature Borromini elements, and you can find some of those in the Milan Cathedral. So he had this personal experience working on a Gothic site before he came, came to Rome. So the kinds of tasks that he would have the workers in the field do, he could explain to them. He knew exactly how everything got, got put up in the field. He knew it all. So he was really intellectual. He had in his own personal library over a thousand books. And in a day when books were precious, that is a huge library. Unlike, say, Michelangelo or Palladio, who had great patrons who brought them into this sophisticated way of, of thinking about the world, thinking about philosophy, Borromini is a kind of autodidact, which means he taught himself things by reading. He became familiar with theory. He tried to load on as many meanings as possible. Meanwhile, Bernini was a sculptor. He was really interested in these close observations of nature, very interested in the virtuosity of handling stone, but not really skillful in architectural questions. So let's look at a couple of projects that they did that are similar in terms of program. Or not similar in terms of program, but let's say similar in terms of ambition. The first one we're going to look at is the Scalareggia by Bernini at the Vatican. As an aside, theme, really. You know, you often get these paintings called things like the crucifixion, or the creation of Adam, or the separation of light and day. These are great biblical themes. The theme of Pietro da Cortona's painting is the triumph of the Barberini. The Barberini are his clients. That's kind of crazy, right? It would be like the triumph of Bill Gates going up in chariots into the sky. 
Something like that. If you've got enough money, you can pay for that. I would definitely be commissioning that one if I were Bill Gates. But look what's going on. It's really quite amazing. It is as though the ceiling of the room has been blown away. There is an extension of the architectural features of the room into the painting, and then a dismantling of those features as this great sense of rising up happens. It's a trompe l'oeil perspective is being used, but it's a trompe l'oeil converging upward rather than converging forward. All of the techniques of the Baroque that we've admired in architecture are being trotted out here with great glory. And that is these complex compositional strategies of diagonal recession, of multiplicity versus unity, of loose handling of paint, strong plays of light and dark, and a moving of the pictorial image almost into the, the territory of theater. It becomes so dramatic and, and so active. Just wanted to show you that as a point of reference for where we've come since the days of Michelangelo, which were not really so very long ago. Just a little diagram from Christian Norberg Schultz, whom we mentioned before, talking about two basic diagrams for the Baroque church. One diagram, let's look at this image for a while, and then we'll get back to our topic, which was looking at the different manifestations of a Baroque impulse in the works of, of Bormini in specific, and, and also Bernini and his contemporaries. The third great member of the Roman Baroque is Pietro da Cortona. And da Cortona simply means from Cortona, which is a, a town in Tuscany. And like so many of these Renaissance guys or Baroque guys, Pietro da Cortona is as comfortable doing painting as he is doing architecture. And this ceiling in the Barberini Palace is often considered to be the best thing ever when it comes to ceiling painting in the Baroque. And one thing that's so spectacular about it is just the very idea of how this thing engages the space below it. When we looked at the Sistine Chapel, or even when we looked at the Farnese ceiling by Anibale Caracci, which we looked at very briefly, just for me to say, not as good as I would like it to be, we noticed that there was this idea that a picture, a framed picture, was transported to the ceiling. So ontologically, and ontological means having to do with states of being, having to do with states of you know, what, what existence we're talking about. So if you look at a picture, you know that that thing is in a different state of being than you are. That's the thing on the wall. That's the image. And so Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel is very happy to keep that clear by framing pictures and having them be up on the ceiling. Pietro da Cortona does something quite different. Pietro da Cortona here is extending the space of the room illusionistically. Quite a 